Buenos días. Empezamos la segunda mesa redonda del día de hoy. Mesa redonda versa sobre esto y habilidades la industria europea del videojuego y modera Emanuel Ecaricio, de la Asociación de Desarrollo Español de Videojuegos, DEF. Muchas gracias. Hi. Hi again, everybody. So, uh, Thank you very much for coming today. Um, it's really an, an honor for me to be, to be here and to have all of you with me. Uh, It's, um, it's amazing to have all of you because today we're going to talk for about uh, a very interesting topic, which is a really big challenge, challenge for our industry, and uh, is the talent, I mean, our people. So before getting into this, let me briefly present our panelists. We have Javier Capel, which is studio manager at Ubisoft Barcelona. This is a veteran European studio, but also, only, also Spanish studio because they are already in Spain uh, for 10 years and developing big 25, well, if you count the, the past, the, the biggest AAA games developing from Spain, like Assassin's Creed Valhalla or Rainbow Six Siege. We have also Marie-Claire Isaman, which is CEO of Women in Games, one of the most important institutions advocating for increasing presence of women in our industry. It's a pleasure to have you here with us today in our panel. We have Jari Pekka Kaleva, which is CEO of, of the European Game Developer Federation, and uh, also senior policy analyst in Neo Games, the hub of the Finnish game industry. Thank you, Jari Pekka. We have here Dries Deriker, which is Academy Director of Digital Arts and Entertainment at the Hovest University College in Belgium. He has uh, been an educator for seven years and in one of the leading game development, VFX and 3D animation bachelors in the world, recently becoming the director. Congratulations. And also he working in Spain, in Elite, Elite, Elite 3D in Valencia. So welcome back in Spain. <laughs> and uh, we have Hanessa Hossein, She is associate professor in higher education from the University of Surrey, and she researches on how video game can impact on life opportunities for people from different backgrounds, especially girls. So we, will, we have a very, very heterogeneous and interesting panel. So let's begin our session. Um, as, I, as I said, we are talking about our big uh, strengths but also challenges which which are our people our talents and when uh, we talk about talent i think we have three main topics or challenges how to attract the talents our industry how to train properly the talent and then finally how to employ the talent no? it seems easy but it's, it is not so let's start with the first challenge if you if you want when i say to attract i mean we have to be an attractive industry for everybody. And when I say everybody, I mean all kinds of people, no matter their gender, ethnicity, age, or academic and working background. We really, as an industry, we want all the active populations to contribute developing games. Because why would we leave out a part of the population? It, it seems not reasonable. Uh, talking about that, We are talking about diversity in our industry, and surely gender, equity and parity is the most visible goal now, as we are still at the European level at 24% of women workers, while, while they represent almost 50% of the video game players. But we, I think we all also have to consider a broader definition of diversity. I mean, often more, more people with backgrounds in other uh, skills like business administration, law, science, or other people who can requalify in game development skills and contribute to our industry. So the question mm -hmm. I would propose to our panel is how we can achieve a real and broad diversity in order to break down the barriers that still prevent an important percentage of the population to contribute to our industry. I think that Anessa has a lot to say in this topic because her research is just about that. Yeah, so um, hello everyone. Um, 
I'm going to start with the gender issue, particularly around Please. girls. Um, as, and then also another issue that was highlighted yesterday about the lack of skills or having the challenge of skills, particularly in the gaming industry. And one of the things that was highlighted around STEM skills in particular. Now, we know that there is a global shortage of STEM skills uh, across the world, but also that women or girls in general are very much less likely to go into STEM itself. So when we're thinking about girls going into the gaming industry to work within the gaming industry, for example, they actually have less, actually many of them don't have many STEM skills themselves because they haven't actually gone into doing STEM degrees. And the reason for this might be because STEM is often seen as a masculine subject and girls probably do not want to go into something that already has decided for them, this is not for them. So my research, however, um, shows that if girls play video games when they're teenagers or regularly play video games when they're teenagers, they're three times more likely to go into doing a STEM degree uh, later in life. Uh, so the reason for this is not always very clear, but my feeling is that the reason why they go into STEM subjects if they play video games is because they feel legitimized in that particular uh, by playing those video games. So one of the things we can do is to try to get girls playing video games much more regularly and throughout their life. So, for example, initiatives like Games in Schools or even Girls Do Code, for example, uh, they are trying to implement much more um, programming skills and playing video games in schools themselves. But we need to go a little bit further because those are just initiatives. We probably need to have a big curriculum change itself where there are policies where video games are part of the school curriculum as well. And I think that if we have girls playing video games, then they will more likely to go into STEM skills and then funnel into the game industry in the end. Thank you. Thank you, Anissa. Uh, of course, gender is the biggest goal now. So I will pass the mic to Marie Claire because she's working on that for a long time and maybe she can uh, summary what, she, what they are doing uh, from uh, yeah. Women in Games. Yes, sure. Um, hello everyone. Um, I'm delighted to be here. So thank you for the organizers for inviting me. Um, there are many lenses in which the subject of um, attracting talent can be approached. As a CEO of Women in Games, I'm going to focus my answer on attracting talent, talented women into the industry, retaining, developing, and nurturing them, and to create a fairer and ultimately more successful and culturally mature video games and esports industry. Some statistics uh, were mentioned yesterday regarding gender balance, and also again this morning in the sector, but. It is worth me repeating this one more time um, and providing some context in order to address the question on attracting talent. So women and girls make up 50% of the global population and approximately 50% of players across the world. But globally, as has already been said, only between 20 and 25 work in the games and esports industries. It's also worth bearing in mind that within that 50% of the population, all of the other diverse characteristics exist and intersect. Someone once said to me in a debate on diversity, Marie Claire, there are lots of minority groups, not just women, to which I replied, women are not a minority group. <laughs> they make up half the population. And within that female population exists all the other diverse and complex identities and minority groups. So I just want to be really clear about that. Um, and so, uh, yeah, <laughs> okay. Um, so, to raise the level um, of talented women entering and remaining within the sector, we must do more to make the industry more attractive to girls and women. To do that, we need a serious cultural change within the sector. Since Gamergate in 2014, there continues to be some very challenging issues for us 
Um, in the last few years, there have been problems of workplace harassment at major game studios, with some cases still ongoing. And at gaming events, continue to be unsafe for women. Earlier this year at GDC, one of the biggest annual global gaming events, there were reports of drinks being spiked, women being belittled and undermined when speaking, women being harassed and hit on relentlessly, and two women were lured to a hotel room for a pit, um, and then they were assaulted. Um, and that is just not acceptable at this moment in time. The this should not be happening in our industry and should not be happening at events. Uh, a, a major, this is the major event in the world. Um, so I would say, as a young woman thinking about an education or career in games, this kind of environment, which is reported in the media and in the press, just simply isn't appealing. So if you're trying to attract more girls and women into, into the sector, this kind of behavior, it's got to stop. W women in games have been working relentlessly on, on lots of initiatives to work with event organizers, but the event organizers need to engage with us. You know, sometimes we're asked, could we just use your logo? Can we just put the Women in Games logo on our event? But that's not the answer. The answer is to work with women in games from the minute you design your event to make sure that all these things are thought about. Um, if I was being kind, I would say sometimes it's just that event orgas, organizers focus on other things and they genuinely just haven't thought of issues like there are no meeting rooms at an event, so people go and have meetings in the hotel rooms. That's being kind. But I, I think this is a, a, a big issue and it, it does have to change. The other thing that I want to talk about is that there are increased levels of toxicity and harassment online for women. We work with um, a, a market research organization called Brighter, and for the last five years, they've been running um, a female gaming survey. Um, and sadly, it actually shows that um, toxicity within gaming is on the rise, and it is particularly prevalent in a female gamers' experiences. As a result, female gamers are often discouraged from playing the games they love and then further discouraged from wanting to have a job or a career within a sector that is not, not welcoming. Um, in Brighter's 2020 uh, study, data showed that both male and female gamers experienced similarly high levels of toxicity showing that toxicity is an issue across the entire gaming community. However, further exploration in subsequent surveys showed the experiences that girls and women encounter are often much darker and threatening. Sexist stereotypes being aggressively quizzed about their gaming skills often lead to more violent verbal abuse and even threats of rape. More disturbingly, the abuse doesn't always stop when the players leave the game. Some instances manifest in serious consequences outside of gaming, including stalking and threats transferred into real life. I'm not being melodramatic here. This, this is, these are facts. Um, and, you know, I'm only presenting a couple of examples, um, and we at Women in Games have many more. But, and here is the positive, the purpose of Women in Games as an organization is to empower girls and women by building a fairer, safer, more equal global gaming ecosystem. We are addressing these challenges head on and we are working on actionable initiatives to change this negative aspect of the industry. Um, we can only do that by working with partners and with trade bodies who are increasingly supporting our, our work. Um, and I do want to say that, you know, uh, there are some, re we have some really great corporate ambassador partners who are also providing us with, you know, lots of support and information about how, how this problem can be addressed. But we really need the whole industry and policymakers to get behind us so this, this can be solved. Because if this image of the games industry doesn't go away, then it's going to be very difficult to attract girls and women into it. Um, I, I have nearly finished. <laughs> in 2019, with the help of in-game and um, Video Games Europe, which was previously the ISFE, 
we published our Women in Games guide, Building a Fair Playing Field. And the guide is a major piece of work researched and written by myself and Sharon Tolani Sage. It contains five spheres of action which are um, creating a fair working culture, ethical game design and development, gender equality policies, community and education. Um, and each section contains introductory content, showcases and um, women in games listed um, recommendations. Um, I feel like I'm taking up too much time, so I'm going to cut this right down. Um, and just, to, just really to say, I want to conclude by stating that Women in Games has many solutions, but needs the full support of the sector um, and policymakers. So I'm just repeating that again. And I think we all should work strategically to address harassment and toxicity, particularly of girls and women, if we are to attract the very best female talent into the industry and make a fairer, safer, attractive environment fit for a competitive global market of the future because we must keep our eye on that future and if the games industry is to be truly competitive in the global market then it must it must become it must become a safer fairer place for everyone okay thank you Marie Claire Th thank you for for taking advantage of, of this uh, time to denounce all these things because there are terrible things and, and should, not, should be repeated every time. So just to go on, we, uh, I, I, would like, I would like to ask Javier, as a big company, not only in Spain but throughout Europe and the world, how you have a big responsibility in that because you are employing a lot of people worldwide. So I, I would like to know how a big company uh, tries to implement policies, internal policies, to improve diversity, to improve gender equality, to improve yeah. the, um, the openness of the, of, of the industry of all people. So, uh, first, hello to everyone and uh, thank you for the panel. I cannot add too much already to what uh, Anissa Marie said uh, from Ubisoft and specifically from Ubisoft Barcelona. We fully, fully agree with you. In fact, I was going to mention that uh, from our point of view, my point of view, let's say, I see two perspectives or uh, course of action uh, to improve how women are integrated into the video game ecosystem, into developers, and we are fair with everyone. One is to improve the way women are treated today, exactly what Marie Claire said. And uh, you put a lot of examples that I was a bit shocked, to be honest, uh, because that shouldn't happen. I fully agree with you. And, and uh, that is shocking. So that's the first, very first thing we have to do. Um, not only uh, Ubisoft, the whole industry, the whole uh, ecosystem is everyone. We have to make sure that we come all together and make sure that that doesn't happen. I mean, that's killing us. And uh, the second big part for me was uh, once uh, we treat this or now we talk about this, is how we make uh, girls, women, or small uh, women and small girls come into the industry. And uh, I think there is a work to be done uh, on uh, schools, on, on uh, let's say, and when they are young, when they don't have, uh, today they don't have the reference, they don't have uh, the visibility of what they can achieve in the industry. That's the second part for me, um, I would say. Uh, from Ubisoft, um, we've been working with uh, Marie Claire for a long time now. Uh, we support many initiatives uh, group-wise, like the creating the HG groups uh, in many studios. Uh, we appointed um, Rashi as a diversity and inclusion uh, BP uh, with whole power on the company. Uh, there is a real stream of, um, let's say, um, uh, mentality in, in that way that fits uh, all the studios and all the developments. Internally, I can say that, for example, in Ubisoft Barcelona, we do some talks. Uh, some women in the studio go to schools, to, uh, to really small, uh, small schools. Eh? I'm not talking about university. I'm talking about uh, primary uh, learning. They go there, they do the talks, and uh, at least it's something we do with the aim to change the future. Let's say. Thank you, Javier. Uh, before to move to the next topic, I would like to ask our panelists, uh, as a big company, it's clear that you have the, the means to do that and to the people also to just do this, this reflection and to try to change the industry. But what can do small companies, small indie companies of 5, 10, 15, 20 people? Because our experience is that a lot of these companies, 
doesn't even have the time to think about that. It, not that they don't care, but they are just in their projects and they don't have the time. What, what I don't want just to, also only to you, but for example, also Marie Claire, have you worked also with small companies, what they can do? Uh, maybe reading your report and, and try to apply the conclusion, was the first, <laughs> but what can be done for, uh, for small companies, which yes. are the mass, vast majority of European game yes. developers to use? Shall I? Yeah. Um, uh, yes, I think a any company of any size can read the report and, and look at the recommendations, think about it. But even that takes time, we know that. We even designed it so that it could be read in small sections and that you could just read a small bit that was relevant to you. But I think that it, what the important thing that small companies can do is to attend events like uh, like this even, you know, network with people, have more informal conversations. Um, we have a lot, Women in Games has an ambassador program and in, where we have three types of programs, but one is an individual ambassador program. And we, a lot of our, we have 1,400 individual ambassadors in 70 countries um, around the world. And those individual ambassadors um, are often from small indie studios, but it gives them an opportunity to join our Discord server, to um, join our groups, where if they're having a problem in their studio or they want some advice, they can very quickly get an answer through our community. Um, and, and, you know, we have a, we have an, a network community across Facebook, LinkedIn, and, and, and social media of over 70,000. So you can always get some, some support and some, some advice. So that's what I would say to small studios, because I do recognize that on a day-to-day -day basis, actually adding this into another layer of work you've got to do is very hard. So that more informal connection to get the support you need is what I would recommend to those small studios. And, and also, just finally to say, I answer every email that's sent to me, and I'm not trying to suggest everybody email me, but our team, <laughs> but our team um, will always answer people's questions and support and help them wherever we can. Thank you, Marika. I, I think it's a very broad topic. Uh, we should talk about that all day, but we have to move on now. So. I'm, which are, we are going to, to uh, talk about how to train people. The, for the last nine years in, in Dev, we have been sending a survey to our companies, and then we publish a yearly report with all the figures of, of the industry in Spain. And the only figure which surprisingly isn't changing is the percentage of studios with difficulties in order to fight talent with the right skills which has been fluctuating between 50 and 60 percent. We saw yesterday that in the European Union is 40 percent from the report was, which was presented yesterday. This is a huge amount of studios and companies that says that can't find people with adequate training. Uh, we ask why. So the 76 percent of companies say that um, there is lack of professional experience is the main reason, but also uh, training courses that are too general, 60%, or not adapted to the needs of companies, 56%. So I think here we have two challenges. On one side, maybe the in is the industry moving too fast for academia to follow it? Or is the academia being too conservative and is not launching more innovative programs which can address industry needs? So. I would like Dries, Dries to, to talk about that a little bit because you, you know you're, you were working on this topic. So please. Yeah, gladly. Um, yeah, there's, I think, three big points that come uh, when, when you have to train talent. I, and the first one for me is really understanding that this is an industry that's a bit different from standard industries and it's an industry that's built on passion. and. All the people that go into it are very passionate. Yuri also said it before. You have to understand that. That is one of the main factors that uh, builds into this. When a standard student goes into higher education, usually they shop around and they're looking for degrees and they're like, oh, look, I, I like architecture or biology and I'm gonna go into this or that. And they're shopping around. This is something that I don't see with games education. We have people coming over, 14 years old, asking, oh yeah, this is what I'm gonna do later. And they're already working on it right now. Uh, and then they know four years from then, they're gonna study this degree. So these people are very passionate about it. 
There's, it's not for everyone though, but it, they're very passionate about it. And this should be no different from the students or from the staff. Your staff also needs to be passionate about it. And that's where it kind of differs from standard academia. You cannot just take standard academic practices and force game education into that. Um, partially because of the way that it it's needs to be taught. It's very practical, it's very applied. Um, on the other hand, it's very technical and you need a lot of skilled people to teach those things. So that's not easy to find, those skilled people. But those people need to be passionate about the subject, but also passionate about education. And that's a difficult match to find. But I think it's a very important part of it. If you don't have a passionate, coherent team that really has the identity of a game developer, then you're not going to get passionate students that have that identity of a game developer. Which brings me to my second point. What I see a lot of uh, degrees trying to do is they try to do too much at once, doing nothing at the same time. Um, it's a very key part of, of games education is understanding that the games industry is a very broad term. Um, there's a lot of different facets to it. Um, even the difference between mobile development and AAA development is huge. Um, there are parts to it like programming, but there's also an artistic side, there's game design, there's a business side to it. You cannot put all of these facets into a single person. And if you can, those are very special people and they exist, um, but that's not the standard. You have to understand that specialists are needed and to have those specialists, you need to have deep knowledge for those students. You need to really create a profile that has deep knowledge on certain parts of their part that they want to be good at. Um, it's good to try to create profiles that know everything, but they're not going to be great developers because they need to have, it, it's better to create a profile that is, for example, really good at making 3D characters and they have a broad overview of other things. Um, but it, it, you need to understand that you need specialists in this industry to create really cool, technically difficult uh, projects because that's what games are. They're extremely difficult. Um, projects were with a lot of interdisciplinary things coming together so you need specialists to make that happen and i feel like that's where a lot of uh, higher education programs kind of miss the ball um, which brings me to my last point um, you need a quality standard the games industry doesn't really care about your degree it cares about your portfolio and if you don't have a good portfolio and you have a great degree they won't really care they're not going to hire you because your portfolio is not good enough so that's a very important that you need to, it's very important that you need to understand that you need, a, you need a pretty high bar, you need a quality, and you need a standard, and you need to be able to hold yourself to that standard. If you cannot hold yourself to a certain standard and say, if you don't pass this bar, you don't pass this class, then you're going to run into issues where you're graduating people who are actually not fit for the industry. And I feel that is our responsibility as higher education, uh, from my personal perspective. Um, and when you are educating people, you're educating them for an industry. And when you graduate them, you're giving them a stamp of this person is ready for the industry. If they go out and then do not find a job, you've kind of failed at a certain point. So finding that match um, where you have a passionate team that really understands the industry, where you have knowledgeable people uh, with deep knowledge on, on the different aspects of game development, and also understanding that you need those specialists, um, I think is going to be a major factor in growing the rising demand for this industry. Because it is a industry that is mature there in some areas than in other areas. Um, I personally, from, uh, I'm from Belgium, where our game industry is still growing a lot. Um, so there's a lot of need for talent. Um, but if we want to make this industry look more mature on the world stage, um, definitely when it comes from an educational point of view, we're going to need programs that are tailored to what the industry really needs. And the only, well, not the only, but one of the biggest things you can do is listen to them. Go talk to them. Listen to what they need. Thank you, Dries. It's very interesting. Jerry Pekka, do you think that uh, in Europe, as, a, as an industry, we both work in an association, and we, we are involving training... Uh, institution and schools and university because I have su such a feeling that they we are just disconnected they are doing their business train people and then uh, we, we see that something is not working but maybe as the industry we need to do something and which is the what is this something or maybe we have to uh, involve them in some kind of working groups 
or, or uh, in the associations, or maybe we have to also uh, try to find uh, which is not working and go on to the public sector, to the government, to the European Commission to show them that there is a problem. So what do you think about that? Um, yeah, indeed, this is a very important question at the moment. And of course, we first have to acknowledge that there are in some countries like Lithuania, for example, where there is only one educational institution existing. So the first challenge is to secure that in all countries there is a sufficient amount of uh, both secondary and higher education dedicated for game development. But after that, it gets more complicated. Um, the first I think one of the things that we are missing a little bit at the moment is that we are still somehow thinking that the games, making games is uh, something super cool for everyone. Everyone wants to become a game developer, and that's definitely changing. And of course, the low hanging fruit for all of us is what Marie Curie has mentioned. We have to secure that uh, our industry is attractive for all people, including the, all the minority groups in the industry. But beyond that, we have to work harder to make the games industry uh, game development itself more attractive because you have other options in games. You can become a streamer, that's a valid career path. You can become an esports player, that's a valid career path, and so on. So we have to increase the attractiveness of the game development as a hobby. And then, if someone wants to become a best coder in the world or best uh, artist, game artist in the world, they are a bit lost because if you become, want to become the best violin player, it's clear you have to go to this school and go to have these courses, go to this school and move to this pos uh, have this position in an orchestra and so on. Same for soccer. If you want to become the best football player in the world, you have this kind of track, that position. But for the game development, we are lacking that path to the top of the industry. And making that clear for everyone uh, would be really important to secure that those young kids who are interested about entering the industry, as you mentioned, are very passionate about it, how to make it clear for them that this is the route you have to follow. Um, the second part of uh, this is, of course, then that we are often discussing about if the degrees are enough. But in the end, for the games industries, they will never be enough. It's always about the fact that you will have, depending on the degree, two or three years, perhaps five years in the master's degree, to become the best in the world and not you just graduate and have your degree. So ideally, the degree is just the base for your greatness. And then the challenge for the industry is like, of course, first of all, we have to somehow communicate what are the industry requirements. The first way to do that is to secure that the students are integrated in the professional communities as early as possible. So they have a little bit of connections and ideas and networks early on, what it means to work in the industry and how it works. So if you have a local IGDA subters in your city, for example, how to secure that they are open for students. The second uh, far more tricky part is that many, especially on the programming side, uh, we are using different kind of uh, online courses, for example, for Coursera, inside uh, trainings into uh, game industry studios. But their uh, demands might be here, and then the level of the things you get from the degree are here how to provide this kind of um, information and how to bridge that gap. And of course, the first thing is be transparent that these are the courses used in internal trainings. This is your goal where you have to end up to. But it's not enough to just tell that. We have to help the educational institutions to uh, not necessarily make the degrees themselves better, but make it clear that this degree is just a base and these are the things you have to do in addition of that degree to actually reach the the top position in the industry. And all the time also remind that games industry is all the time changing. Now we have a big wave of AI tools coming and those are always opportunities for students to actually be the first ones uh, to explore how these tools work and actually uh, bypass all the senior people in the industry and have this uh, quick route uh, to the top. And that opportunity is uh, especially for the students always existing and looking for that opportunity is something that uh, especially education institutions should encourage. Thank you, Cheripeka. Javier, uh, it seems to me that what companies are saying to us in the survey is that they are looking for senior profiles because when they say that there is lack of professional experience, of course, a new graduate has not professional experience. So maybe what they are what they are telling us that it's very difficult to find senior profiles for what you are looking for, for your project. 
What, what is your feeling about that? Hola. Hola. So you are completely right. Um, we're looking for seniors, and something um, we discussed, we was mentioned, uh, there is a gap, let's say, between uh, what the uh, enterprises, companies, or studio need, and what uh, the education can offer. Um, I would just like to point out that it's specifically, or more specifically, on the technical senior profiles. I mean, it's very, well, very rare to find a specialized senior guy coming out of a university that doesn't exist by default, let's say. The, the big part of the education of those senior profiles, of those specialized people, come when they work and they get experience in a, well, in my case, in a AAA production, let's say. So there's always going to be a gap, or let's say there's always the option of a, a small gap within the education and the, uh, and the development of uh, a video game. A video game at the end is R&D. So you cannot pretend, uh, the, the, let's say, the education to be just aligned with that, anyway. But we can work on that on the, on the more um, junior profiles or entry level profiles. And sometimes we had that gap, it's true, and that it was not supposed to be there. I mean, um, what we did uh, from Ubisoft is to work with the education, uh, let's say, um, um, uh, people. So we, we work with them, we talk with them, uh, we do meetings, we tell them, look, uh, for artists, now we are not using this software, we're using other software. We're trying to help them to become uh, closer to the, to the standards we use today. Because at the end, we're going to employ that people. And uh, the better we um, prepare they come, the better for everyone. Thank you, Javier. Um, I think we can move to the next topic, which is to employ talents. Uh, always according to our survey, but this time we did a survey between game workers. We asked them for their main challenge. So the main challenge that, uh, for uh, them is finding a first job to break into the industry. This is a problem, obviously, for the training sector because, as, as you said, uh, game development is vocational. You go to study game development because you like this. And for a lot of time, a lot of uh, uh, schools and universities had this uh, motto like, make your hobby your profession. But as uh, the industry goes on, the employment uh, percentage rate fell. So now it's, coming, it's becoming very difficult for, uh, for uh, schools to sell this kind of degrees, which are, for, for example, for, uh, from private university, very costly. So, uh, we have uh, at the on side, as we discussed it before, companies that can find talent, and on the other side, side, talent that can find a first job. So, again, we have a uh, disconnection. So, uh, what it seems to me that maybe is the industry not mature enough in order to offer sufficient internship and trainee programs to new graduates, because we, say, uh, we see that the, the, the industry is made uh, mostly from uh, small companies. They have not the resources or the space or the time to, to offer these programs or to employ new graduates. So how to create more entry-level positions? Uh, maybe Javier can can uh, explain what they are doing from Ubisoft, and then we can try to explore what is needed to, to do that with all the industry, not only with big companies. Yeah, uh, as I said, uh, for us, it's really important uh, to, let's say, train people uh, inside the company. Um, we have, oh, well, let's say, if we compare to other companies, which isn't the case, but we normally like to have uh, juniors as part of the team. Uh, we believe, and I believe, uh, especially in Barcelona, that uh, the, a team of full senior people probably is not the best team. I mean, a, a leverage and an average of, of different expertise, expertises and experience is best. So normally, uh, we tend to invest more on those junior guys, on uh, teaching them a, a junior that is coming to your company and learn how you work and, and learns how to work on an Assassin's Creed or Rainbow, which are projects, huge projects with thousands of people. It's a super valuable for us because you don't find that people so easily 
outside. So apart from the, let's say, local things we can do in, in, in Barcelona, uh, group-wise we have uh, several uh, in, um, uh, programs, like the trainees programs, like the um, uh, graduate program that we take the best students of uh, different universities and we bring them to one studio, we train them, we then we move them to another studio in the world so they can see how the studio works and how it's to work on a project that it's, let's say, been built across the globe. Um, I think it's cultural at Ubisoft to try uh, to move people and, and to share all the expertise, knowledge, um, uh, company-wise. Thank you, Javier. Marike, I think you have also experience and project uh, about that in, in Women in Games, you told me. Um, yeah. Can you hear me? Is that working? Yeah, it is working. Um, yeah, yes, if I can briefly say something. So prior to my role... Um, as CEO of Women in Games, I ran a, a BA and a master's program in video games, art and design. Um, and it, it, through running that and then trying to integrate and work with companies and, and seeing how important those relationships were, I took some of that knowledge in, into what Women in Games are doing. So in the last um, two years, we have started running career... Um, uh, expos and networking events and we've been running them on a platform called Hopin which we first used during COVID so actually we, we COVID taught us a lot of things and within this platform that you have a virtual expo area so studios can come in and they take the expo area they produce their own content within their they're called booths so they have a booth, they, they design their own content, they have open times where people can show their portfolios, where they can meet with people. Um, and then the, the platform also has an, an, an informal networking and meeting space and um, delegates can, can register. So, and, and, and we also have put on um, a speaker programs. So people talk, talking about their career trajectories, uh, we have learning labs. So we're running a whole kind of ecosystem within, within these events. We, we now have three a year because they've been so popular. So we have always over a thousand um, uh, delegates attending. But the big thing that's happened and the, and the thing that's really, I think, very exciting about it, the, is the relationship that started to take place between the studios and the um, delegates that, that come into the event. We have so much great feedback. You know, studios have employed from the events. So they've literally met people at the events and then taken them on. They've also met graduates who are looking to understand what they need. You know, so a lot of graduates might really... I'll just take a company, Sumo Digital. So Sumo had a stand. The, the students or the graduates go to that stand. They then have a long conversation. They look at the portfolios. They consider... They talk about what skills they might not have and that gives them a chance to prepare that properly for a job application so and, and it's been really really successful um, and I, w I would really like for women in games to be able to launch more more of these um, events particularly to attract um, girls and women into the industry obviously but the events are not closed events and 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 we have about 15 percent of males attend the events and they've also found <laughs> employment through through the event so for me the key is making creating spaces you know really good spaces where the industry and those who want to be in it can learn share and connect um, uh, with each other so you know if any of you our next, our next event is in November, so I'm just selling it a bit now. So, uh, you know, Correct. if you're interested, please get in touch. <laughs> Thank you, Marika. I agree with you. It's, it's a very good way. Uh, Dries, you say to me that your employment rate is 95%. Something like that, yeah. <laughs> Which is the, the receipt of the success, um, <laughs> briefly. Yeah. Um, I think what uh, Yari Pekka already said was you have the need for a clear way to the top, a flow from student to junior. Um, and I think that we are achieving that quite nicely in the sense that we have a very clear flow um, from basics to expertise to integration to the game industry, ending with an 18-week internship where 
basically if you get the stamp from us like saying you're ready for the, for the industry, you're already working in the industry for 18 weeks. So that already really helps a lot. And part of it, like I already said, is having that passionate team around it and having a very clear structure where you focus on clear basics that have been where you talk to the industry and make sure that this is what they need and to make sure that this is the technology that they're working with. And then that flows into their internship, which is part of the curriculum. And they have to find that internship. So they know it's coming. They know they need to have a portfolio that is up to par with what the industry needs. So that really helps. Um, yeah, and it also partially helps, I guess, in the sense that we are a public institution. Mm -hmm. We are not funded by private money. So we have the freedom to say, you are not good enough for this. We're going to fail your class. We don't have to beat around the bush because of financial reasons. On the other hand, because we're a financial institution, uh, sorry, financial institution, uh, a public institution, uh, we don't have the resources that a lot of private uh, institutions have. So looking at that, it's not a resource problem because they sometimes have five times the amount of money that we have and we can make it happen, so why not them? On the other hand, um, because we are kind of talking about retain retaining talent, th these educators are also talented people and retaining them is very difficult in a situation like that because you don't have the resources to have 10 people per class group. We work with 30 people per class group because there's no other way. So I, I think there is a certain responsibility there from government agencies as well to look at what are programs that are really working and are we willing to invest in that to, because investing in education for the games industry is investing in talent for the game industry, which is investing in the growth of your game industry. So if you are really if you really believe in that, then this is part of the equation. You can't just only invest in startups, for example. Thank you. Anissa, from the University of Surrey, what is your experience? What are you doing to, in order to, to boost this employability, to facilitate the, the entry in the industry of your graduates? So one of the things that uh, the University of Surrey particularly is very, I mean, we don't have a particular games degree, but what we do have is a very high employability rate within our university. And the one thing that we tend to do is that we have uh, something called a professional year where students go and do an internship mm -hmm. in particular um, companies and they do that for one year and usually when they go out to do that internship, so sometimes we call a sandwich degree, when they go out to do that internship, they are kept by the company because they have already trained them up. So I think these are the kind of things that game companies probably might want to invest in or have more relationships with universities to have these sort of internship years. Uh, thank you. Something we also, uh, I was also shocked when you yesterday told me that your filter is at the first year. Only 25% of students go, goes, when, go to the second year. So you're, you are just anticipating this filter, which usually is when they uh, finish their career to the first year with selection. Yeah, um, uh, what's important to note there is because we, because of government regulation, we are not allowed to do an intake test because of the field that we are in, which is fine because I wouldn't want to do that anyway. Because I believe that if you want to have truly democratized education, you need to give everybody a chance, regardless of their background. And it's very difficult to gauge someone's capabilities from just one moment, from a single exam, from one week of training. So I believe everybody needs to be able to have the chance to prove themselves in that first year. Do you have the dedication and discipline to work on it every single day? Because this is an industry of passion. You need to have that passion to work on it every day. And if you can do that, then you're going to make it. You're going to go into the second year and the third year. You're going to go into the industry. So having that first year as a sort of filter, but also a clear training moment, for it, it filters out the people that aren't passionate enough to, to make it into the end. Um, however, I mean, I say that now, but there's also a lot of extra factors that factor into that, right? I, it, it's not just about discipline and passion. It's also about their own financial or socioeconomic uh, situation at that moment. 
which is kind of sad to sometimes see where there's really good students, but they just cannot make it because they have obligations at home or they, they're just financially not stable enough to make it. Um, where we try to help as much as we can as an institution, but I mean, we also don't have the means to help everybody. So if you truly want to democratize your education, um, I think Sweden has a, um, a system where you get an allowance to go to higher education. You actually get paid to go to higher education. I don't know if that's entirely correct. Yes? Um, that is, I think, a fantastic system because it completely democratizes it for everyone. Um, yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Dries. I think that we have some time for questions from the public at this stage. So I know that it is a very broad topic, but uh, if, ah, okay. Hi, um, so thanks very much for, for the very interesting discussion. Concerning the skills gap and the training needs, so it struck me very much that uh, the best people to know who, you know, what are the needs of the industry are the industry. This came across very clearly. Uh, and therefore, uh, my question is, to what extent uh, does the industry plan to do something together to address the skills gap and the training needs. So we've heard some interesting examples about Ubisoft graduate training program, women in games, uh, Dries was speaking about internships, huh? but clearly the skills gap is still an issue, so there's a need to do more. Voila. So I was wondering what does the industry plan to do more? Is, is, is there an appetite for example, you know, if we're coming together and doing joint projects, pooling investments, creating joint training programs at European level, a training academy, etc. Uh, you know, I think that might be an interesting avenue, you know, to go straight for straight for goal, <coughs> rather than, uh, or as well as as well as engaging with the educational establishment and talking about curricula. You know, the two things can be complementary. Thanks. So, uh, of course, the, one of the main things to keep in mind that the uh, situation is different in each European country. So, uh, there are uh, always these kind of actions have to be tailored to the local needs. Uh, there are lots of educational institutions in Finland, for example. So the actions there are a bit different uh, than in some other countries, like in Lithuania. So in Lithuania, the industry is uh, actually, uh, through the trade association, working hard to push the government to provide more funding for the, actual, for the new educational uh, cor um, you know, courses uh, and uh, more game education in the higher education institutions. But that's not a cap in Finland, whereas uh, the industry is working together with the educational institutions uh, for, uh, for example, using Erasmus funding and together with some other um, countries to build this kind of skill, ca uh, skill um, patches where you can identify your level of skills or what is needed for certain professions uh, to build this kind of projects. Of course, the challenge is that do you get uh, uh, that funding from these highly competitive EU funding instruments? And uh, beyond that, uh, of course, there are other things uh, that uh, can be done to actually foster this kind of uh, mainstreaming of the games education in Europe. And one of the things that is perhaps missing on the EU level is uh, the fact that at the moment Erasmus program is very much focused on the uh, sec securing that uh, free movement of the students to other countries, free movement of the educational specialists from the educational institutions to other countries. But what we would need perhaps is also the exchange programs for the um, massive online courses themselves. So that we would ha make all those marvelous uh, online educational resources that are done in many countries in English available for in other countries and mainstream them across Europe. And so that we would have the best resources for game education across Europe. And this is, of course, something that uh, uh, game companies themselves uh, can contribute on, at least by making uh, clear that these are the resources that we are using at the moment uh, in our internal edu uh, education inside the companies, internal training in the companies, 
so that uh, students know that, okay, these are the things that we perhaps should focus on if we want to get employed. But definitely industry is working on, but uh, this is an ongoing process. So if uh, you have any ideas on your local country on how to improve the situation, I'm sure that local trade associations are more than happy to engage in this dialogue and improve uh, the quality and, uh, of the game education, because in the end, their future depends on that, uh, access, access to local talent. Um, I'm listening to yesterday and this morning, I'm, lots of things, we, we've talked a bit about game development skills, but um, listening to everything that's been spoken so far, the games industry doesn't only need game development skills, it also needs things around legal skills, entrepreneurial skills, business skills, marketing skills, and what we have is many students graduating with these skills, but they're not focusing in the video game industry. Yeah. And what we really need to do is try and think about how do we get them to specialize within the video game industry? Because that is what the video game industry needs next to become more mature. Yeah, so. yeah. This, is, this, is a, this is an issue because, because uh, we see only also in Spain. So we have a lot of people passionate about doing games, but business people are just doing business and to, that, to direct themselves to other sectors, but usually not to game sectors. Yeah. So how we can attract this kind of profiles? Well, I think one of the things that we can do, um, I'm, I'm thinking from an academic point of view, because I'm at the university, is that we don't have any minors in game, game development or anything, so we can do business majors with games, but we don't do that. Because that's right. what even considered, and I think it's something to do with the game industry themselves, going to universities, having conversations like this, saying, this is what we need, could you help us to create these things? And I think that's what's needed. I, I think some, in some universities, they might be a little bit reticent about doing a whole games degree, but having a games part of a degree, I think that they might be more willing to do. Yeah. May I add something on that? So one of the ways universities and uh, companies are working together is actually supporting local incubators and accelerators, securing that after your graduation, you would be able to enter uh, some kind of track to enter, enter, entrepreneurship. And this is highly important for the industry that we also get the first round startups as early as possible, because it's much easier to fail uh, when you are a young person and then work a little bit uh, for the companies with experience who has, have as an entrepreneur and then launch your usually much more successful second round startup early in your career. That those are often the basis of the successful studios in the national ecosystems. And from that perspective, you are spot on on the need for the business skills, uh, and, uh, but uh, they can also be acquired through accelerators and incubators. There are questions? Okay. It works, yeah, thank you. Uh, I, I actually just want to follow up on Martin Dawson's question uh, to, to the panel, and I think you asked a very good question. Um, I, I, I think we need to have a structural approach, and I think there are things that the industry institutions can do together. Uh, I think we've heard many good suggestions, but I also think we need actually a proper mapping. Uh, of course, there are things, education is a member state's competence, etc. But I think if we want to make sure that Europe has the right talent pipeline for the future, because that prepares very long time in advance, I think it could be great to do an exercise through a project in mapping with the support of member states, uh, the sector at national level to really map out the skills gap. Uh, and I think we saw just recent data from uh, actually the European Commission's, you, you have uh, a DAISY indicator, uh, digital economy and, and skills indicator. And I think we saw that, that 3.9 students they graduated with an ICT diploma. I'm not sure how that fits with the 20 million ICT specialized worker we want to have in, in Europe by 2030, but I think we need to have a holistic, strategic, structural overview, and that doesn't hinder member states from pursuing their own competences, but I think, we, I think this is where Europe can facilitate and, and be supportive. Thank you. Thank you. No? Uh, I was wondering if uh, an approach like um, screen skills in the UK that was uh, a way to uh, create a kind of common view of industry needs 
including video games, um, and, and, the, and the academy, and the, uh, and the different aspects uh, that, that affects to, to, um, uh, to, to, to get more people uh, within the industry, uh, is, is an approach that can be uh, also, uh, um, I mean, a kind of uh, European screen skills could be of some help um, to tackle this. What do you think? Do you know screen skills, right? You're talking about what? A screen skills from the UK. Yeah. Ah, okay, okay. So, um, there are happen a number of projects actually around Europe to identify the skills needed in the video game industry. And one of them was the skill patches project from Helsing, the screener skills in the UK and so on. But the issue is that they have been national. And yeah. one of the big uh, topics that we hope that we see an Erasmus project or Horizon project or something like that, to take that uh, to the European level and uh, somehow bring those uh, different systems and initi initiatives together to build a more European approach uh, on identification of the skills in the, that are needed in the video games industry. Of course, you have to start from somewhere, and it's usually focused on perhaps programming and game arts and game design, but step by step, of course, that has to be uh, widened uh, to also identify the skills needed on the legal side, HR side, uh, entrepreneurial side, uh, and so on. And it's often also perhaps a bit forgotten that it's not only the core skills that are needed to work in the video games industry, it's also many of the soft skills that might be sometimes lacking, like team working skills, uh, cross-cultural communication skills, etc. And those in particular are perhaps uh, much harder to integrate to this kind of uh, skill uh, patch framework. So, but yeah, you have to start from somewhere. Yeah, uh, I was mean exactly that, 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 that uh, a pan-European approach, a new European approach on uh, screen skills, our own screen skills could be of, of, uh, you know, of help for, for, for this problem. And, and it's a question, at the end of the day, the industry is the same. I mean, the, the, the professionals that the industry needs in, in France, Spain, uh, Belgium are, are the same kind of, of uh, profiles. So, so from my point of view, it's, it's, it's a question of, you know, to, to think, including uh, software skills, as you, as you say. Thank you very much. We have time for one more question, maybe? No? Okay. <laughs> so, thank you, everybody. It was very, a very interesting panel. So, let's move on. Thank you.